thank you all for being here. I'm going to tilt that up a little bit. I'm so happy to, to be here this morning. I'm actually really strangely excited about this because um, I feel like this is a uh, coming together of things, a culmination of things for me that I didn't know were waiting to come together. So the opportunity to do this helped me put those pieces together, and I'm really grateful for that. And first, I'm very grateful for our music. Thank you so much. I couldn't think of anything more heart-centered and more opening than having the strings with us today, so I'm really grateful. And I'm grateful to Mary and Christina for their flexibility this morning with the Daily Word and your patience with that. But I remember sitting here last weekend listening to the Daily Word going, that's exactly perfect for next weekend. But it didn't occur to me to change it until I walked in and Mary went, you know, the Daily Word doesn't seem quite right for today, does it? Huh, it's funny you should mention that. <laughs> so those are examples of wild divinity, actually. So I'm really excited. This image here is a picture from our yard that I took um, that will be on the cover of the new collection of poetry that will be out next month. So I'm very excited about that. All the other pictures on the interior of the book are pictures from... Um, Shell Fisher, who is uh, one of the leaders at an insight meditation community in the uh, Winchester area, she takes these beautiful, beautiful photographs, so they accompany it. So, wild divinity. For years, I have been um, attempting to live from the heart, from my heart compass, which I wore today in honor of that. Um, because it's how I, I strive to live my, my life, from my heart. However, I, I realized I didn't really have an easy way to describe how you live from your heart, because people ask me that a lot, because I talk about it a lot. <laughs> Um, until one day I was sitting in Water Street Studio where I would go for Friday writing time, and I picked up a book, which I meant to bring with me and forgot. Uh, it's called Beauty, the Invisible Embrace by John O'Donohue. And what I tend to do sometimes is just open a book and see what it says to me, and I opened that book um, to a chapter titled The Joy of Shapes That Dance, The Restless Beauty of the Ocean. Great title, right? I got one sentence into that chapter one sentence, and I found these words that I didn't know I had been looking for for a long time. And these are the words. The words sea and ocean are too small to image such wild divinity. And I felt like I'd been hit with something. Those words jumped off the page, wild divinity, and into my consciousness and sang to me. And I started to write um, immediately the, the title poem for the new collection, uh, wild divinity. But I still didn't know that it was a new motto for my life. I didn't know in the process of writing it that this was life, a life-changing moment for me. I just knew I had to write these words. And some of you have heard the poem before anyway. Um, I Sometimes it takes me a little while to catch up with the words and the, the meanings that arrive through this process of writing for me. And that's okay. Um, but I knew it was special because once I had written this poem, I kept finding myself wanting to read it aloud over and over again like some kind of declaration. So I did. I took it out into the sacred circle on our property, and I read it in the circle. And then I read it walking around our yard to the flowers and the trees. And I took it to the river, and I read it to Mother River. Um, it, was, it became this commitment that I was making to a way of living. Uh, and this declaration for my life, which was such a joy to share. But then I had to kind of figure out, okay, I'm saying this over and over again, and I know the universe will challenge me to live that when I say it. So what does it really mean to me to live that? So I sat with that for a while. And then when I had the opportunity to speak here about it, well, to speak here at all, the first thing that jumped out to me was, okay, let's talk about wild divinity. So when I picked up my pen and paper and went out to sit on our porch, to uh, start to put together words about thoughts about how I would talk about this. When I first picked up my uh, notebook and looked out the window, there was a praying mantis outside uh, on one of the plants right outside next to the porch. So I went and sat there. And as I sat there, a butterfly came too. And it was interesting because the presence of those two things reminded me of something. They each brought a word to me. The praying mantis spoke to me about quiet presence. And the butterfly has always talked to me about transformation. And so as I was sitting there beginning to put words together, it struck me so strongly that everything I needed to discuss wild divinity was in those two words, presence and transformation. And those two creatures had been there in that moment to bring me that reminder. And that was in itself the perfect expression of wild divinity because that's what it is for me is being present in that moment. There's so much that can be learned 
in any moment, a quiet moment sitting on your porch. So receiving those reminders just like the John O'Donohue book, in a moment, whether you know you need it or not in that moment, that's living with wild divinity. And sometimes those moments are wildly ecstatic, and sometimes those moments can be wildly mournful. But the important part to me is that they always reveal the presence of the divine, no matter what the situation. One of my very first transformative moments of wild divinity before I, long, long before I would have had words for it, was a really, really simple, quiet moment um, that I probably wouldn't have described as wildly divine. But it was a very powerful moment for me of learning about listening and the importance of that. I was walking through the woods, at the edge of the woods, on um, Lee Drive in the Battlefield Park. And I'm walking along, as I always do if you know me, looking up for the birds. And I suddenly heard this voice that said, um, and it wasn't a big booming voice of God, you know, not that kind of thing, the bushes didn't burst into flame. It was this little quiet voice inside of me that said, hey, if you go around looking up all the time, you're going to miss something. And that voice was quiet, but so certain that it stopped me in my tracks. And once I stopped in my tracks, I looked down. I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll listen. And I looked down, and there was a great big toad right where my foot would have fallen had I kept walking. And I stood there just really very surprised by, this, by the presence of this toad. And I just looked at him, and he looked at me, and I smiled. I don't know if he was smiling, but I, he would have not been smiling had I kept moving. Because if he hadn't hopped, I mean, literally, that's where my foot would have been next. And I was so touched, not just by the moment that we got to share together, but by the, the sorrow that I was saved. Had I kept moving and hurt him in any way, I would have been heartbroken. So it was just this little tiny moment of listening that really had a profound impact on me because of what I would have felt had I not listened. So it's not always the message you receive. It sometimes stops you from doing something that would have been a whole different lesson. So, But that's honestly what wild divinity really, living with wild divinity really means to me is that listening, that really deep, deep listening. And in moments that you expect, when you would be expecting to listen like meditation, or moments where you're just walking through the woods and you don't know that that message is coming. And it's listening to the world around you. It's listening to the people around you. It's listening in general to a rock, a tree, anything. Um, but it's always, always listening to that divine presence in that moment. So to demonstrate the ways that wild divinity has moved in my life and transformed it, I want to share a few poems and the moments of divinity that inspired those poems. Um, when I was... Again, while I was still working on this, as I was sitting there with the butterfly and the praying mantis, at one point a hummingbird came a couple of times. And I honestly think that was to remind me, because I do get nervous when I do a talk, right? And he came to remind me of the joy that I would have in this moment with you guys. And I was really grateful for that reminder to focus on the joy. So again, just what I needed in that moment. So thank you for the joy of this moment and sharing it with you. So after years and years of writing, I mean, really, that's what it's come down to for me in my writing process, is that I am listening. It's a moment of opening my heart and listening to that voice that moves through me that fills the chalice of my heart with words. Um, but there are other times when I didn't know I was listening, <laughs> and the words come anyway. And there are moments that I don't expect from unexpected things, unexpected sources. Uh, you never do know where they might come from. And most of the time, well, all of the time, when a poem comes, it comes for me first. There's something for me to learn in it, something I needed to know, or something I needed to be reminded of. But then sometimes they're also really very specifically for someone else as well. So I go through a process of learning it for myself and sharing it with who it's meant for. Um, always, they come from these moments of awakening, moments of open-heartedness that are such a joy for me in the writing process. Um, but uh, sometimes the unexpected, as an example of that, um, is a poem called, oh, I forgot, I have one. Is a poem called End Measured Mile. The inspiration for this poem came from a moment that I would not have described as ripe with divinity. I was in my car just driving down the road. 
I was on my way to my favorite place, um, uh, George Washington's birthplace, National Monument, where I go to hang out with the birds, where I do spend most of my time looking up. Um, but I was driving down this road. I've driven it dozens and dozens of times before and passed this sign dozens and dozens of times before. But today, there was a, that day, there was a little tap on my shoulder that said, hey, you should look over there. So I looked, and there was this sign, and it just had three words, end measured mile. But that was a life-changing moment for me. I felt like everything in that moment stopped. Everything shifted as soon as I read those words. Ooh. <laughs> that was exciting. <laughs> Confirmation. Um, I don't know if any of you are Harry, Harry Potter fans, but it was like the, the thieves' downfall, the waterfall that they go through, where it completely washes away disguise once you go through it. And that's what it felt like for me, that moment, where just seeing those three words that I'm sure I've seen before, but in that moment, it was like, whoa, completely. End measured mile. I don't know if you can read that script. But um, I knew as soon as I got to my destination that I needed to sit and find a still spot in the woods and write down what was knocking at the door of my heart. So um, this is a poem called End Measured Mile. Three words on a sign I had passed dozens of times, but never seen before. End measured mile. Not only words, not a statement, a command. One that my whole being felt. In that moment, a shift, just like that. One moment, everything was the same, then three words seen in passing, and nothing was the same. Every cell rearranged and measured mile. Every single mile I had measured to that point, every comparison made, every place where I told myself I fell short of the mark, every one fell away. End. Begin. What a relief. Life without an odometer. Nothing but the open road. A journey not to be measured, but walked, run, danced, lived. With sorrow and joy, immeasurable. With each step unique, what then to compare it to? Unknowable distances yet to cover. This moment alone in the woods, the only one that matters. Until the next. To end again where I began, the only measure. So for me, that was this profound lesson that came completely unlooked for um, at an unexpected time in an unexpected place. And luckily, in that moment, I was paying attention. Instead of just driving past that sign that I had driven past so many times before, I was um, present enough <laughs> to feel that little tap on my shoulder. And that's not to say that I ignored that little tap every single time before. I honestly believe that moments are sometimes ripe for that lesson to be learned, and maybe it wasn't until that moment. Um, I do have a tendency to beat myself up over not learning fast enough, so um, it's important to remember, and I remind myself of it a lot, that sometimes it's just not the moment to learn it. A lot of times I get poems or pictures like this um, that I don't know what they're for until much later, and that's okay. I receive them when I'm open to receive them, and the message or the learning or the deepening of the lesson can come later. And this is my heart compass. This is the visual that I know I've talked about before, that I carried this picture around in my head for a long time, and I didn't know what it was or what it was for. And I finally drew it out on paper one day, and I, I came to call it my heart compass. And a friend of mine looked at I showed her the drawing, and she said, you know, that would make a really nice necklace. I had never thought of that. <laughs> so I had it made into a necklace, and I wore it every day for years and years as a reminder of how I wanted to live my life. Pamela remembers when I first got it. Um, and it was a daily reminder of living from that place of my heart. So um, 
There are two poems in the new collection that are uh, about archers. And the second one, cleverly titled The Archer 2, is another one that came from an unexpected place and an uh, unexpected time. Um, though in a moment of openness in meditation, but not uh, the response I was <laughs> expecting to find, I was actually just really concerned about, I had some issues, some things I was concerned about with the state of the world, as I'm sure you're all familiar with right now. Um, you know, whether we could really reach that goal of living from a place of heart-centeredness and what I could do to help us get there. And I was sitting in meditation, and I took all that concern with me into meditation, but I really tried to let it go once I got there and just focus on my breathing. And as soon as I got to that place where I was just focusing on my breathing, this image popped into my head that took my breath away. It was an archer with the, the arrow ready to go. Um, but then, and in, like in a dream, it was me, but it wasn't me. You know how that happens where it's kind of you, but it's kind of not you. And then all of a sudden, like in a mirror, when you see a duplicate image over and over again repeated in a mirror, there were all these archers, this huge long line of archers in a row. And the words um, that came with it that were really loud once I saw that image was, if enough of us are aiming, we are sure to hit the target. And that really, really took my breath away. And it gave me a great deal of hope because I knew there were so many people really, truly, honestly, already trying to live from a place of love. And I just needed that reminder again in that moment. And um, these words came from that afterwards, after the meditation and after that image took my breath away. When I came out of meditation, I wrote this. It's called The Archer Two. Again, cleverly titled. An archer stands, arrow home, ready to fly. Slow, steady breaths to ensure a smooth and accurate flight. Hand anchored beside the mouth. The target beyond the reach of her vision, yet her aim is true for she does not sight it with her eyes, but with her heart. The eagle takes flight. A single white feather drifts slowly back to earth. A bird's eye view reveals archers the world over, arrows home ready to fly from millions of hearts. Archers of love take aim. So again, that was exactly what I needed in that moment and didn't expect it. So uh, again, a moment of wild divinity in my life that gave me just what I needed. And, and the important part too, I think, is gave me just what I needed without even knowing the right question to ask for what I needed. You know, just taking that with me into that moment, my concerns, and being open. Now, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes the poems are very specifically for another person. Um, so this next poem, The Ascent, was very, very specifically uh, for someone else. But before that, it was this incredible gift for me. Um, again, one that I didn't expect, but it was just this amazing moment. Um, but I do want to mention that in the new collection, there is a whole section that deals with grief. And this is one of those poems that comes from that section. So there... Um, this amazing young woman, Kaylee Leahy, which some of you may know her. Um, she went to the same high school, was in the same graduating class as my daughter, Jessica. And she lived down the street from us from a very young age, so we knew her all the way growing up. And she had recovered from cancer. She got in high school. Um, but then she developed a second form of cancer because of the drugs that they used to treat the first. And um, eventually, she did pass. Um, but some of you may have heard her story about it's just over a year and a half ago. She shared it very passionately and very courageously, her, her zest for life in our local community. She shared it far and wide, and it was really beautiful and so filled with grace the way she shared her story. But at the age of 19, a year and a half ago, she passed away. And it was a really heartbreaking loss for her family and her friends because she was such a bright light, and I feel a really great loss for our community and our world as well. 
But I was again um, at Water Street Studio for my Friday writing time a couple of days after she passed. And um, I had this, I was, you know, I would bring my lunch and I would just sit and write and whatever would come would come. But I didn't even get to my lunch. I had this, as soon as I sat down, I was this really, really loud voice that said, you really need to get your notebook in your hand and pay attention right now. Okay. <laughs> so I picked up my notebook and honestly, I, I, I feel like I wrote this with my eyes closed because I, the vision was so vivid. I was there with her and it was, I felt her presence so strongly and it was this beautiful moment that she shared in this vision um, of where she was now that was such a gift to me. It was so moving. And I was so honored and grateful that she shared it with me. And I would like to share it with you. It's called The Ascent. And I'll do my best. Come, walk with me a while. The slope here is gentle. The gradient will increase ere long. But for now, walk easily beside me. The trees move gently by. Occasionally, there is a break between stands of pines where we can glimpse how far we've come. Not bothering to check how far we have yet to go. The ascent requires all our focus. Each step, a journey of its own. No unnecessary words pass between us. There will be a time, as the grade increases, when I will have to ask you to turn aside so that I may travel on alone, despite your reluctance. We both, we both know I must make the last few steps in solitude with reverence. Fear not. As I break free at last of the company of even the trees, the view from the peak will be the joyful culmination of the climb. My view is different, yet still I am able to see you from here. The steps we took side by side, seen from here as a golden thread in the tapestry of time, hung gracefully upon the walls of heaven, the great weaver at her loom. In her hand, the thread of my life, not cut short, but trailing out behind her still, so much of the story yet to be told. The slightest of smiles upon her lips, her hands deftly weave my thread into a new portion of the tapestry. This ascension, then, not the end of the story, but simply the beginning of the next ascent. I was so moved by those words and that image that she shared with me. And as beautiful as that moment was, everything that followed after the writing of that poem were expression after expression of wild divinity. I knew, obviously, Kaylee's parents, um, but I was still a little bit reluctant to share that poem with them. I wasn't sure what it would mean to them, how they would feel about it. Um, but I knew it was for them, so I knew I had to share it with them. And I found out, after I shared it with them, that Kaylee's father right after she had passed, had written a post for Caringbridge, I don't know if you're familiar with that site, but um, about the mountain. And so it was this moment of, ah, we were seeing the same thing. And then um, previously through Water Street, I had participated in a poetry show where poets were given a work of art to draw inspiration from. And then at the end, they, the show, they had a show where the poem and the image were posted together. And so the year that Kaylee died, they reversed the process. And a poem was given to an artist to draw inspiration from. And so I submitted the ascent. And this is the image, the painting that came from that. Um, it's by local, a local artist named Kat Warren. And it's titled Ascending. And I, it brought tears to my eyes the first time I saw it. It was so beautiful. And so I let Kay Kaylee's parents know about the show. Um, 
I was concerned about them based on my own reaction to it the first time I saw it. I was concerned about having them see it for the first time in a large group of people. So we were able to set up a preview for them to see the painting in advance. And um, they were so moved by it, but the, one of the first things they said was, is it for sale? So they now own this painting. And all of that came from that one moment of wild divinity of openness and willingness to listen and a beautiful, beautiful moment shared with Kaylee that I was very grateful for. So that moment touched not only my life, but in my sharing of it, it touched many other lives as well. Kat was the, uh, the artist we connected about it as well, and she was very moved by the poem. And she actually painted another image um, later on as well, so there's more than one. So while there have been many profound lessons and moments of inspiration um, from these moments of wild divinity, there have also been moments of profound joy and laughter. Um, I don't know how much joy all of you <laughs> find in the company of snakes, but <laughs> I find a great deal of joy in the company of snakes and in, in most moments in nature. Um, and not every moment of wild divinity inspires a poem, but they do inspire these joyful connections. And there are two, again, at George Washington's birthplace, two moments that I shared that brought me incredible joy. And it was just being alive in that moment. I was in the woods sitting on a log writing um, in my sketchbook and completely absorbed in my joy of writing. And I, there was something that caught my attention out in front of me, so I looked up and about maybe six or seven feet out in front of me was a black snake, probably three or four feet long. I'm not afraid of snakes, so, you know, I wasn't, I didn't feel the need to get up and run away. <laughs> I figured, you know, it'll eventually send some here. What's the big deal? It's no problem. I'll just watch what it does. Well, that snake came straight for me, and it kept coming closer and closer and closer. And I thought, okay, well, it'll turn aside at some point, right? And, you know, once it's a couple of feet away, it's too late for me to move, because I will startle it, and whether it's poisonous or not, it can still bite you. So I didn't want to startle it. And I wasn't afraid of it, so I just sat on my log, and I kept thinking, well, eventually it'll turn aside. It didn't. It came straight for me. And I'm looking down. I'm being as still as humanly possible. And I look down, and it's about this far from my foot at the bottom of the log. And I think, well, there's a log, right? So it's going to turn aside and go on its way. It didn't. It came straight up on the log right next to me so that his head is up on the log. The rest of him's down. And again, he's just a couple inches from my, le my leg. I'm thinking, well, this is really very unusual. <laughs> what do I do now? So I just kept being still and looking down so I could watch what was happening at least. And at one point, he turned his little head towards me, stuck out his little tongue, and then he turned around and went straight back down where he had come from and straight back the way he had come, as if he just came over to say hello. And I just sat there in the woods laughing to myself, like, did that really just happen? That's bizarre. And it was so fun. I really enjoyed it. So then like a month ago, I'm at the same place. I'm not in the woods, I was on the trail, and I get to a point where there's a fork in the trail, and as I'm prone to do, I thought, okay, well, which way shall I go? I'll just wait a minute and see what my heart tells me. And a, a dragonfly came and went off to the left, so I followed the dragonfly off to the left. And I got maybe 20 or 30 feet down the trail, and I heard that sound, you know, when the snake is moving through the leaves, and I stopped, and I went, that sounds like a snake. So I turned, and I looked into the woods, and again, there was a black snake, probably three or four feet long, just sitting there, and it stopped. When it's, you know, I guess it sensed my movement. So we stood there looking at each other for a minute. And I, in that moment, went, I know exactly what's going to happen. And I, I had to not laugh to myself because, again, I didn't want to startle it. And I just stood there and waited, and he came right over to me. He came up and put his head on my shoe. Put his little head just right on, on my toes. And we just stood there for a minute looking at each other, and then he went off back down the trail, to, you know, and... I, it was just this beautiful moment, and I cannot describe it as anything other than wild divinity. Just sharing those moments in the woods with these snakes was so beautiful to me. And I, I have moments like that with birds or butterflies or whatever, and it's just, it opens my heart so much. So while I do have these profound moments of inspiration, um, sometimes it's just fun in the woods. <laughs> you know, wild divinity shows up in lots of ways. Um, but I think that the joy that I find in living with this wild divinity is best expressed in the title poem, Wild Divinity. So I'd like to share that with you in closing as my
pledge to you to live in this way and as an invitation to you to consider living from your wild divinity as well. So this is uh, one of the hummingbirds from our yard. Wild divinity. And my gratitude to John O'Donohue one more time for those words. I want to live with wild divinity. I want the secrets of the night to glow on my moonlit lips. I want the scent of lavender on a warm breeze to be my companion for a picnic in the summer meadow. I want to hold the hand of God, feeling the beat of her all-knowing heart in her fingertips. I want to immerse myself in the mighty ocean and celebrate each drop of water within her. I want to be the perch for the hummingbird as he catches his breath for a moment between jousts. I want to melt with the rocks in the heat of the earth's belly, quietly awaiting my chance to soar, flow, and transform. I want to live knowing each moment is one I've never seen before, nor will ever see again, filled with sweetness and sorrow, light and dark. I want to be the ray of the sun breaking through the cloud, taking my own breath away with hope, possibility, warmth, and light. I want to be love, unfettered and free, tumbling and cartwheeling through the stone gray sky like an acrobatic snowflake, only to land gently upon your outstretched tongue and melt slowly into you.